Hello, this is UkraLife TV, and we continue our broadcasting from Kiev. And our guest today is Milada Vachudova. She is a professor of political science in University of North Carolina and Chapel Hill. She specialized in European politics and European Union. Milada, thank you very much to be with us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be in Kiev. Thank you. Thank you very much. Milada, uh, let's speak from the very beginning. Uh, what is the influence of Russia's war against Ukraine for European Union? What is the impact of this war? This is a, an outstanding question. And um, I think in some important ways, this war is having a positive uh, impact on European politics and on the European Union. Uh, and so before we talk about that, we have to recognize the incredible cost that Ukraine is bearing in terms of lives lost and lives ruined and cities uh, destroyed. Um, so from this terrible, terrible war, I believe for Europe, there are four very like quite positive developments. The first one uh, is reviving EU enlargement, which was dead. It was dead. It was barely, <laughs> barely breathing uh, with several countries of the Western Balkans uh, stuck um, for reason both of the political will of some of the elites in the countries and also for North Macedonia stuck because of the absence of political will on the side of the European Union. Um, and so Ukraine has come and restarted this process, which I think is the most important and powerful foreign policy that the European Union has to enlarge. And that this enlargement is good for both the countries within the EU and of course, good for the countries coming in. Uh, I can go on. Shall I go on to number two? <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Okay. You know, I'm a professor, so I can keep talking. So my number two is removing the Kremlin from domestic politics. It was very active. Russia, Putin, the Putin government, the Kremlin had a lot of soft power, a lot of very active in domestic politics in Germany, in France, in Austria, in Czech Republic, in Hungary. It stays in Hungary still, but in these other countries, including Italy, the far right and ethno-populist parties are now having to distance themselves, remove the money that's coming from Moscow. Uh, and this is helpful for each of these countries. Uh, and then I think the third one I want to emphasize is that thanks to, to Ukraine, the European Union is becoming serious now about liberal democracy being the anchor of European integration. Viktor Orban in Hungary, he wants to separate European integration from liberal democracy. He wants the EU to just be a collection of states, of economies, and everyone can have whatever political system they want. But this would destroy the European Union. The European Union, all of its treaties, its foreign policy, its normative and civilian power, the ways in which it understands, for example, helping Ukraine in this war are all grounded in liberal democracy. What about such country like Germany and France, which have very close connection with Russia, economic connection? How situation change right now? I believe that the debate that is going on inside Germany is so critical to the future of Europe because the German uh, elites who are very active in the German economy have believed for a long time, have let themselves believe, even when every other government told them to be careful, uh, that economic relations, this is just business, right? And that through business, maybe you can make things better, but anyway, it's just business. And as a result, the Russian energy 
the Nord Stream 1, the Nord Stream 2, pumping corruption directly into the heart of German politics, into the CDU, while Angela Merkel was in charge, and into the SPD as well. Let's not forget Gerhard Schroeder, you know, the best friend of Putin. So now they have to realize, they are realizing that this was a mistake. And they also need to realize that it's a mistake they made. It was their fault. They made a mistake. They didn't listen. They didn't think. Um, and hopefully understanding that will make them um understand that they need to behave in certain ways to make up for this mistake. Uh, Milada, uh, security is security of Europe, not just European Union, is a key uh, things right now for European Union as well. There was a period when uh, many leaders, such like Macron, say that Russia could be involved in this European security. Of course, it is not right now, but it was some years ago, maybe some months ago, some years better, yeah? But how now situation change in understanding of role of Russia in this European security? Mm. You know, in the 1990s, when we were building this new post-Cold War European security architecture, Everyone counted on Russia being part of the architecture, not inside NATO or in the EU, but a special partner. And Russia was a special partner um, with a special role, a special seat at the table, a lot of power within the OSCE. Um, and, you know, it is the Kremlin under Putin that decided it wasn't interested in this, this kind of an involvement. And so, you know, Russia's annexation of Crimea and um, uh, beginning the war in the Donbass in 2014 could or should have sort of ended Russia's role in this European security architecture. But West European leaders wanted to keep it. And it's, it really kept Russia in for so long. And it was only now with 2022, for example, being expelled from the um, Council of Europe. So imagine, you know, in the Council of Europe as the club of democracies until 2022. Now, there are benefits for that because Russian citizens could sue their government in the European Court of Human Rights. So what happens now? Um, I don't know because none of us knows. Uh, I think that the French will always try to be the ones who are independent political players, not under the United States, not under Moscow, but independent and maybe serve as some kind of a bridge. You know, Macron puts on his hoodie and has his long phone calls with Putin. Could be useful in the future, but I, I think for now, uh, Putin has done exactly the opposite of, I think, what he claims were the goals. NATO is stronger than ever. The unity of the members of NATO and allies of NATO countries is very strong. Sweden, Finland joining NATO, potentially more countries coming in. Uh, and the whole purpose of NATO is now very clear. It's been revived also. It is now an, essentially going to be an anti-Russian. It is going to be the thing that it was not. You know, Putin claimed that NATO was against him. It wasn't against him. Before 2014, NATO didn't know what it was doing. A little piracy, a little climate change, a little corruption, a little cybercrime. Uh, I still remember the Baltic states being told, no, 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 don't say that you want to join NATO because you're afraid of Russia. Say you want to join NATO because you love America. Russia, that's fine. Now, now NATO knows what it's about, and now it is against Russia. So congratulations, Vladimir Putin. It is very interesting to see uh, um, when we speak about the European Union. It is influence, power, and old members of European Union and new members of European Union. And it, is, and it was constantly very interesting situation and interesting attitude inside European Union. It was many contradictions, uh, 
indifferent themes, and you just say today about Orban, it is a very good example. And we even could remember the interesting cases with Poland, for example, and many, 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 many others. What do you think, uh, how change uh, this um, role of old members of European Union and new members of European Union, like Czech Republic, uh, like Poland and others here, mm -hmm. in maybe last year. Does mm -hmm. this war, which is in Ukraine, influence and have impact for this balance in European Union? This is a great question. Um, you know, we, I, I would have hoped in February 2022, and maybe expected that either France or Germany would really lead uh, the EU in, in helping Ukraine. But as you know, they were both slow in different ways, never against Ukraine, but slow, you know, Olaf Schultz, Schultz, we have a new term, Schultzing around. Have you heard this? <laughs> it means kind of, you know, taking your time. <laughs> uh, and as a result, it is right. The Scandinavian countries, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, the kind of northern Central Europeans, new members working with old members, old oldish members like Sweden and Finland. They joined in 1995, so they're relatively new, have become uh, a new power center within the EU. And I think it's very positive. Now, in for Ukraine as a candidate country, I think two things are very important. First of all, joining the European Union is amazing because when you come in, you are a full member. You have so much power at the table. And in a way, it is impressive that the old members give the new members this power to sit at the table as full members. And you can use this power, as we say, for good or for evil. So we see the example of Orban using this power in terrible ways. But you also see other new members using it in positive ways. And, and just having a, for a small Central European country or a big Central European country like Ukraine, buffeted by history, by Berlin, by Moscow, the geopolitical benefit of a seat at the table in the European Union, and of course, NATO, is a big reversal of fortune. I come from uh, the Czech Republic, you know, a plaything of Berlin, of Moscow. Now we are full members. Um, so this is important. However, as a candidate, you are not a full member. And so as a candidate, you have to go through that uncomfortable process, which I think is more difficult for men than for women in the government of having to, you're basically asking to join a club, a club that gets to decide its rules. And so it's important there's the political will on all sides that the process will end in full membership, but also the recognition that as a candidate, you are in a weak position. You, you want to any country joining the EU, whether it's Sweden, 25 years ago, 20 years ago, or Slovakia or Ukraine wants to get into the EU, cares more about getting into the EU than the EU cares about letting it in. It's like in a business deal. If you want the business deal, but your business partner is like, mm, they're going to be in the stronger position. It is a very important question for Ukraine, especially in the economy. Uh, is it possible uh, for example, for Ukraine to be a full member uh, or a be, a, to be a candidate uh, to European Union and to play by our own uh, rules. Mm -hmm. What I mean, for example, uh, in European Union is tax system, tax system is some economical rules. But for Ukraine, after such big war, we need to you know big changes, many reforms, and we need to go forward very fast. And that is why we are worried here that this classical, you know, tax system and other things are not comfortable for our, you know, uh, go fast going forward, you know. Mm -hmm. 
And I think you're absolutely right that what Ukraine needs to do after victory and, and during the war and after victory is to uh, go fast and surprise the world, which it is already doing, let's be honest, We're surprising the world. My, my people who live in rural North Carolina, everyone knows now about Ukraine and is impressed with Ukraine. Um, I think the answer to your question is, two th again, two things, that right after the war, Ukraine, and during the war, Ukraine has a lot of flexibility. It can make decisions that are to help with victory. And then after, there'll be a time, a year or two or three, I don't know, where there'll be a lot of flexibility, where Kiev and also with decentralization, the different parts of Ukraine can make decisions based on what they need. However, when it comes time to become a full member of the EU, 90% of what the EU does is that internal market. And the internal market means that a a, a, a businessman owns a factory in France or Italy is competing with the businessman woman who owns a factory in Ukraine. And so if the businesswoman in Ukraine, if she can have her factory pollute more into the river or or not give women a, a paid maternity leave or not have um, uh, help for dis someone who's disabled on the job, they will be able to produce products at an unfair low price. And so to be a full member of the internal market, this economic regulation has to be harmonized. I will say though, in the experience of every country that's come in from post-communist Europe, including Croatia, Slovakia, Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, the economic benefits of being a member of the EU are much bigger than any costs in terms of regulation and tax um, system. Also because foreign investment will come if they know they have a secure place in the EU market. So if you're thinking of moving a factory to Ukraine, important in that decision will be knowing that Ukraine will be part of this internal market and you'll be able to freely without any customs checks, without any problems, be able to sell the product on the entire EU market. It's a huge opportunity to make a lot of money, both for Ukrainians and for foreign investors. Milada, uh, it is different stories to be a candidate and to be a member of European Union. In that case, I remember the history of Turkey, which is not very simple. Yeah, it's long, long, not simple story for Turkey. Uh, what do you think uh, for today? What are the restrictions uh, uh, for membership of full membership of Ukraine in European Union? Uh, what I mean, uh, for example, if we just look for division of old members of European Union and young members of European Union. And uh, the main influence, constantly, traditionally, uh, um, was connected with Germany, France, and many say that Germany and France make a you know, key decision in many, many processes. But if, for example, Ukraine and some other countries became a member of the European Union, do you think that the, this part of influence will be uh, you know, forward to these new members and it could change the balance of power inside European unions. Hmm. Or maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know exactly. Oh, I think it will matter. Ukraine is a big, dynamic country. The It has a large economy that will be, I think, uh, a leader in Europe in many ways. I'm extremely optimistic about the human capital and also the state administration here, like the way in which, I mean, we can tell many jokes about this, but the idea that Ukrainian trains run on time, you know, these days you can never see a German train, much less a British train <laughs> run on time. Um, the Kiev is incredibly beautiful. The streets, the sidewalks, the public transportation, the shops, it's, it's, I can see that here there is um, you know, way ahead of 
uh, other countries that are post-communist that I have worked in. So coming in, Ukraine will be a big economic player in the EU for a number, not just because of its size, but also because of human capital and innovation. Um, you know, geopolitically, it's going to also be very important because the Ukrainian military will be showing the way for NATO. I mean, uh, I think the uh, the many American military people have already talked about how here you have the kind of expertise now that no NATO military actually has, except maybe the American one. Um, uh, so yes, it will be important, and especially if it can work closely with its neighbors, you know, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and also the Scandinavian countries, so Sweden, Finland, the Baltics. As we talked about earlier, I'm a little worried about the neighborhood. You know, Orban is a problem. He, you know, authoritarian leader in the heart of the EU who who is making deals with other authoritarian leaders, including Putin. This has to be dealt with. Um, and there's a fear of other places having this kind of illiberal um, uh, governments. And so this will be another place where I think Ukraine can be a leader. We already say, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could let Hungary go outside of the EU for a while and bring Ukraine in, <laughs> you know, change places. I'm not saying Hungary shouldn't come back, but right now we, not helpful. Um, looking forward if if ukraine can be a a model for inclusion um including in society disabled people women uh, minorities of different kinds religious minorities the lgbtq community the lgbtq community uh to show that you know we're we're not orban's hungary i get very sad when people assume that just because i'm from central europe my people or my values or something somehow like Viktor Orban's. He's done too much damage to our reputation. And I see Ukraine helping us uh, take back Central Europe. <laughs> uh, Orban is uh, one interesting example inside of European Union. This next interesting example is Brexit. Mm -hmm. Does Brexit matter for future of European Union? Oh, well, actually, Brexit has helped the European Union because everyone, including far-right parties, see the disaster that is Brexit for the United Kingdom. You know, the British citizen is paying much higher prices for goods, including food. There's shortages that you don't have in Kiev, for example, in the pharmacies. Um Everything is more expensive. The goods available are, are less varied. And uh, the life chances of young people to study, to travel, it feels very depressing. And so the hope is that when this government, this Tory government leaves, there can be a rethinking of the relationship between the United Kingdom and the EU. Of course, it's very important that the UK is in NATO. So in terms of that alliance and the a sense of shared values, uh, in, in a way, the, the war has brought the UK closer to its neighbors because of the shared values of liberal democracy and sovereignty and freedom. Um, but I'm sad for, for the United Kingdom. This was uh, hurting themselves. They hurt themselves. And, and part of it is because of disinformation. The people going to vote to take the United Kingdom out of the EU, uh, EU did not have good information. They did not understand how being in the EU was helping their daily lives. Today, only about 30% of British voters say that Brexit was the right decision. Oh, I also like to hope that maybe Ukraine and the United Kingdom can come in together. <laughs> and I think Ukraine will come sooner. <laughs> sooner, earlier. <laughs> uh, Milada, uh, next uh, theme which, uh, which seems important for us, because very often we speak about the new world order. And if you look for China, for example, and if you look for USA, everybody said that it will be, uh, you know, two main actors uh, in future world. It will be USA and it will be China. 
But what is the role of European Union in all this uh, history? Mm -hmm. uh, when, you know, it's a game for two main players. Uh, what do I mean? Uh, I mean economy, because, for example, we know that polit political ties are very close with European Union and USA, it is understandable, but economic ties are very close with, for example, European, some European countries and China and uh, others. We know about many interests of European countries in Africa, for example, and it is another situation in America, with America and other things. What do you think, what will be the role of European Union in creation of this new world order? And mm -hmm. how strong is European Union will be in situation when this big game among two big players will start? Mm -hmm. Well, economically, the European Union is also a big player, right? Uh, the internal market, the heart of the EU is, you know, very large, easily competing, right? Larger than in, in terms of output than China. Um, so economically, the EU is a superpower, let's say, if um, to use this term. And so now the question is, can it become a superpower also politically? And this is a question of political will. It's a and great here, question. Yeah. Yeah. And here, um, Ukraine is helping because the sense of purpose and unity, um, again, on the backs of you know, tragic loss of life and uh, destruction here in Ukraine, but it is bringing this sense of unity and returning the EU. You know, in the late 90s, the EU had this ambition to be a strong geopolitical actor. After the wars ended in, in, in the former Yugoslavia, the United States went back home, this sense that Okay, now the EU does what it's good at, uh, rebuilding states, state administration, police, bureaucracy. Um, and it was working. It was helping. Croatia joined, North Macedonia, Man Montenegro have done tremendous work. Uh, but then, you know, first the financial crisis, then the refugee crisis, then the COVID crisis, and the rise of ethno-populist leaders, the power of ethno populists in the United Kingdom. I know we we love Boris Johnson for his help for Ukraine, but this was a government that came to you know came to power because of Brexit and a very divisive and hurtful process. Uh, and then the power of Orban and uh, Trump in the United States and Bolsonaro and. And so all of this happening at once meant that the European Union sort of lost its geopolitical ambition and confidence. And I see the European leaders, von der Leyen and others, bringing back that sense of geopolitical confidence thanks to the support that the European Union is giving Ukraine and also to some surprises, right? First, of course, the surprises on the side of Ukraine, the, uh, Ukrainian military fighting so well, but also the state, the civil society, ordinary citizens. Then you also have the surprises of citizens in EU member states, whether old or new, steadily supporting help for Ukraine. People were saying in March of 2022, oh, just wait until the winter comes. Support for Ukraine in public opinion will collapse. Well, it hasn't collapsed. It's still strong. And this means that has helped, I think, the EU regain this sense of geopolitical ambition because this is, I think, the first time that the European Union as a whole has had a foreign policy helping Ukraine and citizens of the European Union understand that because the EU has this foreign policy of helping Ukraine, they need to tighten their belt at home. They're going to have some impact at home, higher energy prices, wear a sweater. Uh, and this is a very important moment for the EU. Now, will it keep it up? I hope so. I hope so. Um, It'll depend on elections. Now, I strongly Election, believe- Elections well, uh, where? Elections well. So in Europe, it will depend on 
you know, if we have a FITSO government in Slovakia, and if in Poland, law and justice wins again and goes into coalition with the far right party Confederacja, this will hurt. So we'll have Orban, so we have Hungary, Slovakia, Poland, ouch. Um, then of course there are the American elections. You mean Trump? You mean Trump? Yeah. Be back? Mm -hmm. Now Trump can go both ways, right? If Trump is elected, it'll be a shock to Europe and they'll, this will become a stronger argument for more European strategic autonomy, more ability to Europe to act independently. That could be good in the long term, but in the short term, it, Ukraine needs America and it needs America not led by Trump. I am an optimist uh, that we will not elect Trump in America. However, it's not bad for the Europeans to think about how much can they do together without American help. So that thinking, I think it is good. Uh, I just hope it's not needed in the next 10 years. It is very interesting uh, what you say about the geopolitic ambitions of European Union. Uh, in that case, what do you think what will be the future um, com communication or, I, I don't know, attitude or existence or neighboring neighborhood i don't know uh, among european union and uh, between european union and russia for example because russia is still important russia is still matter and as i, as I understand uh, russia uh, for europe is a very important question what do you think uh, how uh, what future uh, for Russia is now discussed in European Union? This is a very hard question. I think in the best case scenario, we somehow get to a Russia where people return to thinking about their economic well-being. You know, I'm not going to talk about liberal democracy in Russia I have hope because I believe that liberal democracy is the best political system for promoting human well-being, happiness, <laughs> families, freedom, a nice weekend in the park with your family, um, business. But um, if we can't have all that, um, hopefully we can have a Russia that has leaders that um, see that the population has now suffered enough in terms of their economic well-being and also losing losing their precious sons you know I, I'm 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 heartbroken um of course by everything um and and not everything I include the young and middle-aged men who are Russian who are dying senselessly brutally and for nothing so can we come to a regime that is now thinking about re helping Russian families have security and economic well-being? And if we get to that point, I think European leaders will work with Russia. They want to do business with Russia. Uh, European companies want to sell their products in Russia. We know that some European companies, especially French, continue to sell their products in Russia. Um, and so I'm not I'm not advocating for a return to Nord Stream 1 and 2, not this kind of dependence on Russian energy, no. But coming back to a place where we do business back and forth in order so that people will live better. Um, and that doesn't require the West to tell Russia how to run its politics. It does require Russia to accept its borders and, and, and to end this neo-colonial project that it clearly has somehow wanting to revive the Russian empire, the Soviet Union. I mean, Putin very clearly has some geopolitical reviving of the Russian empire and doesn't care about ordinary Russian families. And that is heartbreaking. Who thinks that Russia could, you know, continue uh, uh, his awful war in uh, Europe, for example, or it could make invasion for Baltic country on something else. And what do you think is it possible? And 
does some uh, uh, countries in European Union still worried about that or, 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 or for now not? I think they should be worried in the sense that if they let Putin win in Ukraine, you know, invading Ukraine was not a rational, uh, it was only rational in this very weird reviving, rebuilding, reconquering the Russian empire. And if that's your level of rational, then why stop at Ukraine? Why not the Baltics? Why not um, all of Moldova? Why not, you know? So, however, I think Article 5 is strong. I think one foot into the Baltic states or Poland and the full force of NATO is in a way, it, it, you know, you could almost hope that he would do that for the sake of Ukraine so that we could get this over with. Um, now, Moldova, more difficult, right? Any country not in NATO. Um, I still remember the Georgians when I, I used to work as an advisor for Václav Havel in the Czech Republic and the Georgians telling us, you know, in 98, how much they wanted to join NATO, this existential threat from Moscow. If Russia ended this imperial project, I think people would be shocked, but it would be quite quick the way in which Russia would again be welcome to diplomatic negotiations and to economic relations. Um, but that ending of the project would have to be very decisive and I think would include paying reparations in some forms to Ukraine. Milada, and last question. I know that many countries, it, 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 it took many time for some countries to be members of European Union. It was a long way from candidate status to full member status, for membership status. Uh, and it takes many time, uh, many, you know, works, many reforms and many monies, we know about that. Uh, what, what do you think, uh, when Ukraine can be? a member of European Union. What is your uh, expectation in it? Well, I was hoping for 2030. Um, this would be my hope. I think more quickly would be um, difficult. Uh, I mean, I think that the European Union should have and Ukraine should have integration at the economic level that goes very fast and already has gone fast. I mean, the, the in some ways, Ukraine is already ahead of candidates who were in the process for years uh, with the integration that has already happened. Uh, but tw by 2030, I expect and hope that Ukraine will be in the EU. 20, 30 years, you mean? I'm sorry? 20, 30 years, you mean? No, 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 no. In the year 2030. So in... Oh, is the year 2030. It is yeah, very yeah. important. Seven, yeah. eight years. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> seven, terrible. eight years. I mean, this is how long, you know, can't, the Czech Republic, Poland, they became candidates in 97. They joined in 2004. Now, Ukraine is going to have some really different challenges, some big challenges of reconstruction. Um. On the other hand, I feel like, as I said, the state administration, the, the capacity of the state, which is so important for uh, a liberal democracy to function, to serve its citizens and to join the EU, I feel like here that can work well at the local, regional and national level. Um, but it will require patience. Even eight years is a long time. And so it requires patience from political parties, from politicians and from citizens who may feel rightly that the, that Ukraine deserves to join um, much sooner. And please, one more question. Uh, uh, what, what do you think? Uh, does European Union will have some reforms inside mm -hmm. the European Union? What I mean, you say that uh, the helping of Ukraine, it was the first common foreign policy. It's very very good step uh, but nevertheless uh, what do you think uh, will European Union became more close with for example a common foreign policy or maybe something will change dramatically inside the European Union maybe uh, Orban is a very good example for some reforms what to do with such leaders or such countries like 
for example, Khan gorillas, Orban, and other things. What do you think? Does uh, some reforms will happen to in European Union in nearest time, or maybe maybe not? How you analyze all this situation? So right now there have been some pretty dramatic reform in the sense that the EU has figured out how to use conditionality against uh, the Orban regime in Hungary by withholding funding. And this is also true for Poland for the law and justice government. So these are both ethno-populist governments that vilify minorities that they consider culturally harmful, whether it's uh, refugees or um, uh, the LGBT community community or or women you know like us feminist women who are strong and not at home making dinner uh and and so i think that this conditionality saying okay you are an eu member but we will still say you we're not going to give you our money if you are going to have these kinds of projects this is a big important step forward i would hope that we would have elections in Poland and elsewhere that would allow all the other EU members to at least suspend Hungary using Article 7. So now you can suspend Hungary using Article 7, but only if every other EU government agrees. So right now, Orban, despite the differences in in policy towards Ukraine, Poland is still protecting Orban and will not allow Article 7. So I hope that that will change because only by suspending Hungary, I think, can we expect change within Hungary. And if you suspend Hungary, then you can open up the possibility of transferring more power to the EU in foreign policy like they do for international trade negotiation. You know, the EU is very powerful in trade because whenever there's a negotiation on the world stage, they send one person to represent all of the EU states in trade negotiation. So in foreign policy, it'll take time, but having more power centralized for foreign policy would help. I think we, if we do move in that direction, it will be thanks to this to to Ukraine creating this impetus and this consensus and actually showing as i said that eu citizens are willing to support the eu in this kind of a foreign policy project milady thank you very much thank you very much to be with us today it was a pleasure for us thank you it's really a pleasure for me too thank you so much and thank you for asking the really the very best questions <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Milada Vachudova is our guest today, and thank you for being with us as well. See you. It's it was so clever again. Thank you.